Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, we are going to explore a fairy tale um, known to many people as Sleeping Beauty, also known as uh, Little Briar Rose. The fairy tales I often think of as our psychic bones. They have been around for millennia and have lasted because embedded in them are really deep psychological uh, truths about life. So in today's tale, uh, we'll think about whether Sleeping Beauty's parents, were they in fact the first snowplow or helicopter parents? Um, they try to avoid fate. Can you really avoid your fate? And how do we acknowledge uh, forces that be that are beyond our ego capabilities for good or for ill? And then finally, we'll be discussing a dream that a listener submitted. Uh, in her life, she is facing a deep betrayal, and the dream images some of that. So it's a poignant dream. Stay with us. Hello, listeners. We want to take just a minute to remind you that you can do a couple of things that would be really, really helpful for us. Uh, you can subscribe to us on YouTube. You can like us on Apple Podcasts. You can subscribe to our social media channels. And uh, you can also become our patron. So we have a Patreon. It helps support us. You get the satisfaction of knowing that you've helped the podcast and you get extra bonus content material. So for example, we recently answered a question from one of our patrons about how to handle frightening dreams this listener was able to wake herself up every time she reached a frightening point in a dream by, by screaming. And she wonders if she's missing something by not being able to stay in the dream and confront the frightening thing. So you can hear our thoughts about that topic, uh, hear dreams, submit your dreams, submit your questions. So we hope that you'll possibly consider becoming a patron. You can go to thisjungianlife.com. And if you click on the podcast tab, you will see there a place where you can check out our Patreon. Thanks very much. So this is Sleeping Beauty, which is otherwise known as Little Briar Rose. And it's a Grimm's fairy tale. In times past, there lived a king and queen who said to each other every day of their lives, would that we had a child, and yet they had none. But it happened once that when the queen was bathing, there came a frog out of the water, and he squatted on the ground and said to her, Thy wish shall be fulfilled. Before a year has gone by, thou shalt bring a daughter into the world. And as the frog foretold, so it happened, and the queen bore a daughter so beautiful that the king could not contain himself for joy, and he ordained a great feast. Not only did he bid to it his relations, friends, and acquaintances, but also the wise women, that they might be kind and favorable to the child. There were thirteen of them in his kingdom, but as he had only provided twelve golden plates for them to eat from, one of them had to be left out. However, the feast was celebrated with all splendor, and as it drew to an end, the wise women stood forward to present to the child their wonderful gifts. One bestowed virtue, one beauty, a third riches, and so on, whatever there is in the world to wish for. And when eleven of them had said their say, in came the uninvited thirteenth, burning to revenge herself, and without greeting or respect she cried with a loud voice, In the fifteenth year of her age the princess shall prick herself with a spindle and shall fall down dead. And without speaking one more word, she turned away and left the hall. Everyone was terrified at her saying, 
When the twelfth came forward, she had not yet bestowed her gift, and though she could not do away with the evil prophecy, yet she could soften it. So she said, The princess shall not die, but fall into a deep sleep for a hundred years. Now the king, being desirous of saving his child even from this misfortune, gave commandment that all the spindles in his kingdom should be burnt up. The maiden grew up adorned with all the gifts of the wise women, and she was so lovely, modest, sweet, and kind and clever that no one who saw her could help loving her. It happened one day, she being already fifteen years old, that the king and queen rode abroad and the maiden was left behind alone in the castle. She wandered about into all of the nooks and corners and into all the chambers and parlors as the fancy took her, till at last she came to an old tower. She climbed the narrow winding stair which led to a little door with a rusty key sticking out of the lock. She turned the key and the door opened and there in the little room sat an old woman with a spindle, diligently spinning her flax. Good day, mother, said the princess. What are you doing? I am spinning, answered the old woman, nodding her head. What thing is that that twists round so briskly? asked the maiden, and taking the spindle into her hand, she began to spin, but no sooner had she touched it than the evil prophecy was fulfilled, and she pricked her finger with it. In that very moment, she fell back upon the bed that stood there and lay in a deep sleep. And this sleep fell upon the whole castle. The king and queen, who had returned and were in the great hall, fell fast asleep, and with them the whole court. The horses in their stalls, the dogs in the yard, the pigeons on the roof, the flies on the wall, the very fire that flickered on the hearth became still and slept like the rest and the meat on the spit ceased roasting, and the cook, who was going to pull the scullion's hair for some mistake he had made, let him go, and went to sleep. And the wind ceased, and not a leaf fell from the trees about the castle. Then round about that place there grew a hedge of thorns thicker every year, until at last the whole castle was hidden from view, and nothing of it could be seen but the vane on the roof. And a rumor went abroad in all that country of the beautiful sleeping Rosamond, for that was what the princess was called, and from time to time many king's sons came and tried to force their way through the hedge, but it was impossible for them to do so, for the thorns held fast together like strong hands, and the young men were caught by them, and not being able to get free, there died a lamentable death. Many a long year afterwards there came a king's son into that country and heard an old man tell how there should be a castle standing behind the hedge of thorns, and that there was a beautiful enchanted princess named Rosamond who had slept for a hundred years, and with her the king and queen and the whole court. The old man had been told by his grandfather that many king's sons had sought to pass the thorn hedge but had been caught and pierced by the thorns and had died a miserable death. Then said the young man, Nevertheless, I do not fear to try. I shall win through and see the lovely Rosamond. The good old man tried to dissuade him, but he would not listen to his words. For now the hundred years were at an end, and the day had come when Rosamond should be awakened. When the prince drew near the hedge of thorns, It was changed into a hedge of beautiful large flowers, which parted and bent aside to let him pass, and then closed behind him in a thick hedge. When he reached the castle yard, he saw the horses and brindled hunting dogs lying asleep, and on the roof the pigeons were sitting with their heads under their wings. And when he came indoors, the flies on the wall were asleep. Mm -hmm. The cook in the kitchen had his hand uplifted to strike the scullion, And the kitchen maid had the black fowl on her lap, ready to pluck. Then he mounted higher and saw in the hall the whole court lying asleep, and above them on their thrones slept the king and the queen. And still he went farther, and all was so quiet that he could hear his own breathing. And at last he came to the tower and went up the winding stair 
and opened the door of the little room where Rosamond lay asleep. And when he saw her looking so lovely, he could not turn away his eyes. And presently he stooped and kissed her. And she awakened and opened her eyes and looked very kindly on him. And she rose and they went forth together. And the king and the queen and whole court waked up and gazed on each other with great eyes of wonderment. And the horses in the yard got up and shook themselves. The hounds sprang up and wagged their tails. The pigeons on the roof drew their heads from under their wings, looked round, and flew into the field. The flies on the wall crept on a little farther. The kitchen fire leapt up and blazed and cooked the meat. The joint on the spit began to roast. The cook gave the scullion such a box on the ear that he roared out, and the maid went on plucking the fowl. Then the wedding of Prince and Rosamond was held with all splendor, and they lived very happily together until their lives end. Mm. Such a great and well-known story. Most of us yes. grew up hearing yeah. some version of that. You know, um, w one of the things that has amused me over the years in uh, the course of all the Jungian study and work and way of looking at fairy tales uh, is contrasting what an interpretive stance looks like with, with the stance that I had as a child. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. As because I certainly did not read fairy tales through a Jungian lens when I was just enraptured with all these tales. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was particularly interested in this tale because as a child, it was my least favorite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I liked fairy tales where the heroine was active and clever and uh, doing something to take her destiny into her own hands. Mm -hmm. And this one always felt to me as a child, like um, everybody just behaved like ninnies, mm -hmm. you know, the parents don't have enough place settings to invite all of the 13 wise women. Yeah. Yeah, just you go know, buy who, another place setting. Right. Of, right? Who does that? Mm -hmm. Of You know, and then they uh, you know, clear out all the spindles from the kingdom. But when her it's her 15th birthday, the fated day, <laughs> um, the king and queen are somewhere off site doing God only knows what, but not paying attention. And and then our lovely um, Briar Rose a actually pricks herself with a spindle. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought, boy, that would be hard to do. So, so um, I'm interested in what is the meaning of this tale? Because from an ego point of view, uh, the people don't do things that make sense. This mm -hmm. is not the way to look at the tale. Mm-hmm. Well, let's start right from the beginning. Let's okay. let's let's take a page out of your Deb of your and, book, Deb, and, and start. And I'm gonna right from I'm the just beginning. gonna um I'm gonna before you give us some explanation, um, we know that you have analyzed this tale in your book on yes. motherhood. Yes. So uh yes. for yes. listeners who might want to delve a little more into that, there it is. <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> plugging it. Yes, I, I did indeed write about this story in my book, Motherhood. So, so we start off and this, there's a king and a queen and they can't have children. So this is a rather common beginning of a fairy tale. And what mm -hmm. we know is that something in the kingdom, which we can see as we can imagine as the kind of dominant uh, reigning attitude is sterile. Mm -hmm. Okay, so something is sterile in the dominant reigning attitude. And interestingly, the, the queen sort of wishes and wishes and wishes, but it's a frog that announces the change. So if we think about that, there's a couple things about frogs. <laughs> First of all, they're kind of wet and slimy. They come up from the depths. Some people would consider them, uh, you know, kind of... Um, you know, disgusting or kind of a lower level life form, you know, so there's, so, so, so new life sort of arises from 
the, the froggy, slimy deeps, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, one of the things um, about this fairy tale, by the way, that I'm just going to sort of introduce right away is there's a lot, let's say that the Freudians have a lot of fun with this fairy tale. And there's a, there is a lot of kind of sexual imagery. And I think it kind of starts right there with the frog, you know? Um, the sexy frog. The, <laughs> the sexy frog, right. There's hope for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that wasn't exactly how I meant it, Joseph, but I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but, you know, frogs, I don't know, there could be something there, you know, about the, yeah, the, the nature of the, the, the moist, messy nature of the sexual act, let's say, with frogs. But, but also, on a more pristine, Jungian, psychological lens, frogs are, are interesting because they can go down to the depths and, you know, they can go down to the bottom of the pond, spend a long time there, and then come up and also go out on land. So, you know, they're kind of a psychopomp or possibly could be, and I think in some other fairy tales they are, you know, because they, they can bring up communication from the depths. And, um, you know, they, they also start life, you know, as tadpoles that are totally aquatic, and then they go to, through a metamorphosis and change into frogs. I love frogs, by the way. Just love well, they're frogs. also very thickened that, yes. you know, when frogs lay eggs, there are these go. large masses Yes. Of eggs and hundreds right. of well, hundreds of of tadpoles will will burst forth. Yeah. So this enormous visible fertility, as fish are often for the same reason, yeah. out of its fertile. That's great. That's great. And I just want to say, if you go to my personal Instagram at Lisa Marciano and you scroll back through to the summer months, you'll see lots and lots of pictures of frogs, including ah. my favorite frog, whom Deb Deb has met. And frog Mrs. eggs. Yes, Mrs. Tablets. Blue. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, in any case. Um, right, so we have the frog. So, new life, feckened, sexy, messy is, is now in the picture. Mm -hmm. And indeed, the, you know, new life arises. So, uh, I think we can talk a little bit about... Um, what does it mean to be psycho spiritually sterile? Mm -hmm. Because right. um, that usually precedes a state of change. Mm -hmm. So it may be that in any number of stages of our life, particularly in midlife, after a, a successful career, after we have you know reigned or created a, uh, some kind of a kingdom of mm -hmm. uh, our lives, we have a career. Perhaps we even do have a family, but there comes this tremendous dry spell where nothing new is happening. Everything is just going on the same and the same and the same. And mm. we begin to get this kind of withered feeling inside of ourselves, and we're mm. craving uh, to be fertile again, whether it's just a fertile idea or a fertile experience or a new relationship. First of all, I just want to say that I loved how you, you talked about a dry spell and withering. Mm -hmm. And so, again, we have these kind of metaphors of moisture you know, mm -hmm. and dryness. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's great. I think we all know that feeling of that, that dry spell and longing for, um, longing for energy to reawaken. Desire, longing for desire to awaken too. There's also something in the beginning that has to do with expectations and legacy. So there also comes a time in our lives where we're wondering, have we done anything that matters? Have we done anything in our lives that will carry on beyond us? Have we written that book? Mm -hmm. Have we founded that organization? Have we contributed to the world mm -hmm. in a way that will go forward when we are gone. So in the beginning, there's also this tension around mortality and what will survive beyond us. Mm -hmm. And all of those kinds of even existential tensions, as we sit in the agony of them, can call something up from the deep, which is much of what Jung promised us 
mm-hmm. is if that we sit in our suffering long enough, some strange impulse of life will come up from the well. Mm-hmm. Right. And, mm-hmm. and I think, you, you know, you're, you're saying it, Joseph, that it's beyond ego. It, we can't think our way out of it. Somehow, something has to be called up from the depths of maybe the first step is, is the longing that the mm-hmm. king and queen are longing for new life. They're longing uh, for, for the child, which is the symbol of new life. And where does it come from? The slimy, primordial, mm-hmm. reptilian depths. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't a- arrive all sparkling and silvery, surrounded by bright lights. And that goes to something that's so central to all psychoanalytic work, Mm -hmm. is that often new life comes to us from the instinctive level. Yes. It's not that um, some kind of gold-clad courtier jumps out of the well and recites poetry or gives Mm -hmm. us a wonderful abstract treatise or um, gives us some kind of transcendent spiritual experience, Mm -hmm. that often we feel dry because we're cut off from the instinctive yes. level of the psyche. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, I just want to say, too, that um, we can think about this, just if you were talking about it as kind of legacy, but we can also think about it kind of what's our relationship with creativity. Mm-hmm. You know, our, our, the, the desire that we have to create, whether it's to create a child or, or to create, you know, something else, a, an organization, uh, a new recipe, uh, work of art, a uh, piece of music. And, and we all, I think, can relate to feeling creatively blocked at times mm-hmm. where we're, we, we have a novel we want to write, but we just can't figure out how to get started. And, it, and I, I think all, everything we've been saying so far applies to that process, too, mm-hmm. that you have to sort of get in touch with the instincts and maybe sit by the well and see what slimy creature wants to crawl up. Yeah. And I think I want to take the idea of creativity down to um, a, a generative feeling uh, th- that it doesn't have to be, you know, some uh, concrete, literal new project of, you know, should I learn how to play the guitar? Should I try to write poetry? You know, should I try to plant a garden? Uh, but that what we're really talking about is a new attitude internally t- toward life. Uh, because oftentimes I think people think, oh gosh, you know, I should embrace some new learning or some new project or go somewhere new. And if, if it isn't fertilized from within, um, then it's just another item on your to lo- to do list. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that is really important, as Jung has said, that there are times in midlife that the ego can just make a decision, as he says in that story about meeting an American entrepreneur who just decided after forming an empire at 40, he was going to retire and have a life of leisure mm-hmm. and play tennis and ride his horses, and then mm-hmm. became very uh, psychologically unwell because the psyche has its own river yeah. that's, mm-hmm. that's going to make its own independent decisions. And as you were intimating, Deb, that it's, um, it's very unlikely that we're going to wake up at 45, for instance, and just on an egoic level decide we're going to turn everything upside down and start on a new path if it doesn't receive the blessings of the frogs, so mm-hmm. to speak, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the blessings of that deep part of the psyche. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so in some sense, you know, I think the beginning of the tale anyway kind of places us right squarely in midlife. It's kind of mm-hmm. a midlife tale. You know, it's like things have gone stale. Mm-hmm. And what do you do when things have gone stale? And that is often a, a feature, a, a feature of a midlife passage, let's say. So, uh, so the baby arrives, there is new mm-hmm. life. And uh, they want to have a, a big, a big party. 
And so it's so interesting that in the original Grimm's, it's wise women rather than fairies. And what do we make of these 13 wise women? Let's talk about them and uh, one being left out. Well, the first thing that strikes me is how ancient the fairy tale is because it seems very pre Christian. That normally you would have a very fast, you'd have a christening, and everybody would have a different kind of process. So, this is, uh, we're back, you know, it feels like a couple of thousand years ago, and we're in the world, you know, of the blessings of the Great Mother. Yeah, that's great. And I will say that, um, not that I'm completely up on this, but I, I do remember reading some recent research where they are tracing these tales back to be many thousands of years old. But the fact that these supernatural, um, wise, ancient women with magical powers are the ones that are going to mm -hmm. welcome and, mm -hmm. uh, and determine something mm -hmm. about this new child. I, I'm thinking about that there are 13 of them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the difference between 12 and 13, there were, uh, you know, 12 apostles. There are 12 months in the year. A lot of things in our um, modern society are based on 12-ness uh, as a kind of completeness. 13 is a prime number. It's an odd number. It, it, nobody buys uh, place settings of anything. Um, I'd like a place setting for 13. That doesn't happen. And 13 has long been associated uh, with witches. So um, here's this number that, that isn't divisible by anything. Um, it doesn't relate to the natural world. Uh, 13 doesn't fit. And so uh, the king and queen reduce it to 12, more manageable, um, more equitable, more balanced. It feels like the ego position is we can, we can handle 12, but not 13. Uh, there's an artist named Judy Chicago. This is just a little sidebar uh, who had a show once upon a time that uh, rocked me to my core. It was an installation and it was called the dinner party. Mm. And it was a triangular uh, table set with 13 place settings, each one of which had been uniquely made. The placemat, the, the, the uh, stemware, the silverware, all of it, um, honoring the 13, honoring the lack of symmetry. Mm -hmm. um, but this king and queen want symmetry. Well, I, I want to say I was just looking something up because I wanted to make sure it was true for a uh, launched in. But, you know, I also wonder if there's something here about the kind of unruly nature of the archetypal feminine. Because ordinarily, mm -hmm. you know, like, why is 12 such an important number? And of course, um, the Sumerians, I think, their, uh, their number system was, was it base 12? It may have been base 12. I think so. So it, it is one of these kind of real archetypal numbers. And part of that is because there are probably, there are usually 12 moon cycles in a full year. But because the moon is not, um, it is not so easily regulated, it's, it, there are sometimes 13 moons in a year. Ah. Mm. So, you know, the moon is as, a, as an image of the archetypal feminine, which is not exactly in sync with the solar calendar and, and sometimes goes rogue and gives us that 13. And, and it is, so there is something about, you know, it's, it's, these, it's, a, it's a wise woman who uh, pronounces death and it's... Um, it's a woman who leads her to her uh, encounter in the tower, who oversees it. So there's something here about, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it brings me back uh, in a way, I, I mean, I think the frog is important because in some ways I think the frog is the precursor to the 13th fairy. That which consciousness wants to shut out, but which will have its way. 
thank goodness, because it, it is that which brings life. Hello, sorry for the interruption. I have just a couple of quick important announcements. First of all, we're offering 10% off Dream School now through December 31st. So if you've been interested in trying Dream School, you can do it now for 10% off by using the code HOLIDAY2023 at checkout. That's HOLIDAY2023 as you check out, and HOLIDAY has a capital H. Also, I want to let you know that I have recently launched an online community for women where we talk about fairy tales. So this is a community of women who are on a journey of growth and empowerment. And as one of our members said, it's a like-minded community of wild women. And so far, the people over there are just awesome. We interact every day on a private platform. There's a live event each month with me where I go through the fairy tale. And it will be uh, timed so that it's uh, reasonable for people to attend from both coasts of the U.S. as well as uh, Europe and the U.K. There are prompts for group discussion. I do a guided meditation every month. And as well, there's an audio recording of the story read by me. This month, we're finishing up Rumpelstiltskin. There's still time to get involved and read all of the great stuff going on as we discuss that amazing fairy tale. And on December 1st, we will be starting with another fairy tale that I love. I think I love all fairy tales called Prince Lindworm. So I hope you'll check it out. That uh, address is spinningstraw.com. And again, that's spinningstraw, one word, dot com. Thanks. Well, it's interesting too with my moon analogy that there are only 12 gold plates. And of course, gold but, is very solar. And if we think of a 28-day lunar cycle, if we divide um, 365 by 28, it goes in approximately 13 times. Uh -huh. So if, there's, uh, if it's a solar cycle, it uh, divides differently. But in terms of, just as you said, lunar cycles, the number of moons in a year, you know, full moons goes to 13. So there's something about the golden plates being solar, and that mm -hmm. puts us into the solar um, year of 12. If the plates were silver, for instance, yeah. there would have been 13 plates because yeah. there would have been 13 moons. Mm -hmm. So perhaps it has something mm -hmm. to do with that preference of the solar. Mm -hmm. And again, yeah. the solar king, the conscious, the ego, mm -hmm. um, the known, as you were suggesting, the orderly, not the uncanny. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a, a very a subtle kind of hat tip. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but of course, there really is something. Uh, it's all over the place about the feminine. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, of course, it's the queen uh, who is infertile. Well, of course, it takes two people to make a baby, but it will be the woman who, who carries the baby. Mm-hmm. The baby she has is a girl, a daughter. Mm -hmm. The wise women are the ones who are invited as the special guests to, mm -hmm. to the celebration of the birth. And then there is an old woman up in this tower uh, who is doing the spinning, which has always been women's work. Right. Right. And then you've introduced uh, all the ideas about you know, moons and that they don't fit into this orderly, you know, 12 month uh, mm -hmm. man made way of thinking about a year. So, this is really a very big tale about uh, the feminine mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and how, feminine. How, mm -hmm, how it works or doesn't work. Right. And what happens if you try to shut it out? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You're either infertile or then you, you, you know, you've kind of brought down the wrath of the goddess and you can't you can't you can't avoid the goddess right that's the other thing about the encounter in the tower is um first of all it's interesting because 15 is always the age that i've heard in this fairy tale which which is an interesting age and i mean it used to be that um girls menstruated later than they do and i think that maybe back when this fairy tale was uh, extant, you know, 15 may have been a pretty common age for first menses. 
you know, so this is a kind of, uh, it's a first entry into womanhood. Yes. I mean, is, is that, it's, it's the, it's, and in, in Latin cultures, there, there's the quinceanera. I'm probably saying that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's at age it's, 15. Mm -hmm. It's, and a it's a of, big deal. Yeah. It, it is, uh, it is the, the official entry into fertility as a woman and yeah. being recognized mm -hmm. as a woman. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is this is the passage to womanhood. And mm -hmm. of course, we have this very, the one thing that always bugged me about this fairy tale when I was little mm -hmm. was like a spindle. Like, I don't think I really knew what a spindle was, but I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't think it was really sharp, right? And then I, I do have some experience with drop spindles, which I believe this one is. And there is kind of a point, but it's like, it's like, it's about the same pointiness as a chopstick maybe yes. maybe a little bit less like yeah. I'm, I'm sorry maybe a little bit pointier than a chopstick but not um not like prick your finger pointy you know it's a really it's an odd yes. image i think unless i've really misunderstood my spindle technology um so <laughs> so first of all you know we've got these parents who what do they do they get this i mean this is a great image right your daughter's gonna prick her finger on a spindle burn every spindle in the kingdom. I mean, these were the first snowplow parents. <laughs> I mean, and this is the context in which I, I talk about it in my book, Motherhood, because it's like, I mean, which I could totally relate to, right? You want to, you want to, um, you want to help your child devo avoid an evil fate. And whether or not that's you hire the very best, most expensive SAT tutor that you possibly can, or you burn all the spindles, to a certain extent, you're you're trying to uh, help your child steer through a potentially evil fate. Mm -hmm. And and of course, I mean, <laughs> lots of us have hired SAT tutors. <laughs> yes, guilty. <laughs> Um, but, but I mean, there are things that we do as parents that are even more, uh, you know, sort of akin to, to burning the spindles, right? We, we advocate for them, you know, when the teacher gives them a bad grade, we can you know, professors are having these stories of, you know, parents contacting professors and trying to renegotiate their child's grade in college or whatever, or, um, you know, we do all kinds of things that I am entirely, um, empathic with because we don't want our child to suffer. We want our, we want to help our child avoid their fate. Mm -hmm. But it, it also speaks, I think a lot to uh, the wish for ego and order and control and management um, that that's a good practical, sensible thing to do. Just yeah. you know, yes. get rid of all, get rid of all the spindles in, in the kingdom. Yeah. As if, as if ego uh, is in charge, as if, you know, and here's the king and queen, so they're the rulers of the kingdom, and we often think that our ego is the ruler of, of psyche. It is, reigns supreme, it runs the show, and whatever it dictates and deems um, w will come about, and that, of course, that is not so. You know, of course, there's going to be an old woman with a spindle up some narrow staircase. That hmm. that ego cannot do this job. Well, the the other thing about spindles is obviously they're for spinning, and in mm -hmm. at least two of the mythological uh, systems that I'm thinking of, feature um, the fates as those who spin and weave. Mm -hmm. So one spins a fate and um, in, in Greek as well as Norse mythology, the fates are spinners and weavers. So, so you know, the, the, this is also where the kind of Freudian imagery comes in is that, you know, Freudian interpretations of this tale will say, well, the spindle is an image of a phallus. And this is this young woman's first encounter with sexuality, which, which I, I actually think that holds. Like, I think that that's legitimate. And it goes to what we were talking mm -hmm. about, about her being 15 and kind of a sexual awakening. Yeah. Um, but, and it's also an encounter with her fate. Yeah. 
that her parents have tried to keep her from. <clears throat> and, and the spinning of, of a creation. You spin a thread, you spin new life, uh, you spin life, and it is also the instrument, you know, in this tale of her death, uh, of being penetrated. Mm-hmm. So right. I, I agree, the sexual interpretation here uh, uh, holds, and so does um, an analogy to menstruation, um, that maybe it's not the finger that's really bleeding. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but that that polarity of making something and generating something and spinning something versus that is also the instrument of the wounding. That's what I'm sitting in as well, Deb. I'm just thinking about what is the spinning wheel do? Mm-hmm. Because it's, I mean, she's kept away from spindles, but by virtue of that, she's kept away from the whole craft of taking ah. raw cotton or flax or wool, taking this raw material and then spinning it into thread, which is then used mm-hmm. to make fabric and or repairing fabric and all the other things. So the spinning wheel is is this object of transformation in and of itself. Mm-hmm. It is a slightly alchemical, I suppose, process, although it's not quite the same. But I'm wondering about about keeping away from that particularly uh, of all things. Mm. So. I'm wondering if this is also protecting the feminine, just as you were saying in terms of snowplow parents, protecting the feminine from a certain level of agency. Mm-hmm. That it's associated, as you said, traditionally mm-hmm. with the women's work, but it was work, and it was this capacity to take some a raw substance and turn it into something refined, something that then could yeah. be used in some kind of cultural way. Could be used to good effect, and so she's also being kept away from work itself. She's being kept away from life, mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. its possibilities and its pitfalls, mm-hmm. and agency uh, too. Yes, all of it, and so we'll we'll protect you, and you won't get hurt, but you also won't really get into your own life. Things will be done for you. Yes. And, and, that, you. and that is kind of that mm. image of everyone falling asleep, right? I mean, we start off the tale with this kind of psycho-spiritual sterility, and then we lapse into the somnolence, you know, they're, and they're, I think they're kind of related states, you know, nothing changes, nothing grows, the fire doesn't even cook the meat. Mm. So it's a real image of stasis. Mm-hmm. Which is a cousin of sterility for sure, and uh, you know, and it's so it's so it feels important that it, it's charming, you know, and all these scenes of you know the horses fell asleep and the pigeons mm-hmm. on the roof fell asleep, but yeah. there's something important there. It's not just Rosamund mm-hmm. who falls asleep. It's not just the princess. It's the whole environment. And, and I, you know, I, I do wonder about, uh, you know, you, you could almost look at it as like kind of family systems, you know, that, huh. that when one person yeah. stops growing, you know, the whole, the whole system kind of locks up. Um, but I'm sure there's other ways to imagine that yeah. as well. Yeah. But you're right. It's a recurring of the original stasis that the tale started out with, mm-hmm. that, that the king and queen cannot have a child. And and now here it is writ large. Uh, even the flies on the wall fall asleep. Stop. All systems halt. Mm-hmm. And as we said, it's in that state of suspension, which is quite different mm-hmm. than death. That all there is capacity everywhere in the kingdom that is the psyche, but everything is suspended, is frozen. Mm-hmm. So all the life force is now secreted away. But they are kept in um, in salt, so to speak, mm-hmm. which is a great preserving agent yeah. that stops things from decaying. But of course, if you give most things too much salt, it'll stop them from growing as well. 
you know, it has this um, locked in stasis. Mm -hmm. But I also, for some reason, I just want to go back to the spinning. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just found myself thinking about um, spinning, it's night work, because during the day, you're out doing other kinds of labor that require sunlight that are how, going on outside. It's also winter work. Mm -hmm. That spinning was not really done uh, during the summer because the days were long and there was so much to do out in the farm, out in the day, out in the orchards. So it's something that's yeah. deeply private. It's quiet work. It's night mm -hmm. work. It's winter work. It is solitary work. It's transformative work. work yeah. Solitary mm -hmm. work. And of course, the great spinners are the spiders as well. Mm -hmm. And she is, in a sense, you know, caught in this spidering place where she yeah. is bitten by a kind of spindle <laughs> venom and then cocooned mm. in this mm. slumber, um, waiting. One might even imagine that, uh, that the venom, you know, of, of the piercing is being metabolized, which is something that you had talked about once, at uh, least about the poisoned apple mm -hmm. metaphor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something has been injected into her, the bite of the spindle, which I, I think is just, there's a lot in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that is really interesting. The, the spider stuff, too, is good. You know, one of the differences between um, Sleeping Beauty and Snow White, and they both involve this somewhat frustrating image of a woman who just kind of swoons and falls asleep for extended periods of time <laughs> is that in in snow white she's she's you know thought to be dead and her stasis is therefore has no end in this story there is a sense of in the right time she will awaken so you know it is amended to you know the, rather than she'll die that she will sleep for 100 years so th there is a sense of um, like a process that just takes time. It takes a lot of time, but um, but we we sort of know that she's going to wake up eventually. Mm -hmm. And of course, the the common um, critique of this fairy tale is it's it's one of the fairy tales that many people assume shows a man rescuing a woman, and therefore. Uh, kind of promotes this antiquated idea that women are helpless, blah, 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 blah. And I admit, Deb, with you, it's not as much fun as some other fairy tales where the heroine has a little more going on. But, uh, but I do want to say that if we take it psychologically, it, it's that something princely in her rouses. You know, and, and what that might look like in our life is we've gone through a long period of being asleep. And, and let's face it, a lot of us sleepwalk through a part of our lives. Mm -hmm. You may sleepwalk your way into a bad relationship and then just stay there too long because you haven't woken up. You might sleepwalk your way into the wrong career and then just stay there for a long time because you haven't woken up. And then one day, something mm -hmm. wakes up. And you think, this isn't right. I need to make a change. And that's a moment of the kind of inner prince constellating. Yeah. So I, I just want to caution us not to, to, to see the rescue from without, but to recognize that the, the prince is an inner potential that we all have, and yes, we can all fall, I think every one of us probably falls asleep to something important in our lives, and then one day we wake up. So holding that idea, of course, the multiplicity of the psyche, that one part of our personality can be in a, in a slumber, and other parts of our psyche are trying to fight their way towards the sleeping part to animate it, mm -hmm. to vitalize it, just as the frog helps mm -hmm. to vitalize the queen and quickens life in her. The prince, like the frog, is trying to find its way mm -hmm. to Briar Rose to quicken her 
in some fashion. Mm -hmm. But what do we make of the briars? The mm -hmm. briar scent will will kill all the previous suitors or the animating forces trying to get in. What what I'm been thinking about is, you know, certainly what Jung says about the unconscious, uh, that it has autonomy and it has its own timetable and it has direction. And that uh, the, the briars um, have their own autonomy, that when these other young men kind of try to fight their way through and say, hey, I'm getting in there, I'm going to go for it. Uh, they're held fast, uh, and they can't escape. Of that, that it's the contrast between ego function and the unconscious, and that you can't force the unconscious. Ego cannot just declare itself um, the ruler, uh, the prince, uh, use a sword, break mm -hmm. in, and dictate. Mm -hmm that the unconscious needs the time that it needs to have its own process. And that's analogous to what we had talked about before with Snow White, that um, while she was lying there, uh, something in her body was metabolizing the poisoned apple and something is being metabolized in this uh, somnolence of the kingdom and it will take a hundred years and that's just the way it is and by the way i do talk about snow white in my upcoming book the vital spark about which we're later <laughs> available for pre-order now absolutely i've done it <laughs> um there's also a parallel theme because the spindle is a kind of thorn that pricks ah. Briar Rose and then puts her into a slumber. And then this iteration of, of, of pricking thorns right. covers the entire kingdom. And, and any of the princes who touch a thorn are put into the, the slumber of death. Mm -hmm. So this iteration of the poisoned dart the poisoned point that makes life inert uh, multiplies and multiplies and multiplies. So in one way it's turned in and in one way it's turned out. And, and so I want to think about this um, unconscious determination to slumber. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes this is thought of as a kind of Saturnine possession. And how many times have we either had an Alessands, or maybe we've been in this situation where when we go to somebody who is in a determined, almost rageful suspension of activity, that the influence around them also has a kind of poisoning of activity, that the entire field is anti-movement, anti-life, anti-change. Mm -hmm. I think of, um, I've had clients whose moms were very, very depressed for long periods, and now there was a tremendous negativity towards the children making any noise, being active, disturbing. The depressed mom. Mm -hmm. I don't want the TV on. I don't want you to be loud. Why are you guys always, you know, making noise? So it's as if the briar patch begins to permeate the entire house, and and all mm -hmm. things must be silent, and all things must not be disturbing. And, and there are other, even darker iterations. You know, uh, this is the kind of Kafka esque trap where. Someone gets involved in a bureaucracy that is a kind of slumbering unconscious machine. And if they try to interfere with the bureaucracy and press it to innovate, to change, challenge it in some way, that the bureaucracy itself will start closing around the troublemaker 
mm. and silence them because of this resistance to change, the resistance to the slumber. And we could find many, many examples of this field that uh, will not be interfered with when the determination is to, um, to quiet, to sleep, to become inert. I had a couple of, I think, related thoughts about the thorns. Uh, I think that's all really great, what both of you have said. Um, first of all, uh, rereading it just now, again, I was really struck by the kind of sexual imagery. So, you know, there's something's trying to penetrate the thorns, mm -hmm. but it's just not going to happen until the right moment when the thorns turn into blossoms and, and it sort of opens to receive him. So, uh, uh, yeah, a little, a little bit of a sexual metaphor, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But also, I mean, I think the thorns and Joseph, maybe this maps onto what you were saying. They're, they're a real image of defense, you know, and, and we can build up thorny mm. defenses. I mean, I'm thinking of a sort of hypothetical case, let's say, where a woman's in a marriage. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty unhappy. It's pretty sterile. It's nothing's, it's not, it's, you know, it's kind of good, you know, as, as often happens, right? We're, we're in a marriage where things aren't great, but they're not terrible either. And we sort of soldier on. And part of how that happens is, as I was saying before, we fall asleep to it. We say, well, you know, it's, I'll, I'll deal with my marriage, you know, after I get this promotion or when the kids uh, leave home for college, we, we've got things to work out, but we don't have the time to do that right now. Or you tell yourself, well, you know, it's just, it's, it's just hard having kids in two careers or whatever. You, you sort of rationalize it. You tuck away the feelings of unhappiness. You don't acknowledge to yourself how you feel. And, and that is both that, process of kind of falling asleep to something, becoming unconscious of something that you really actually do know, and then building up a lot of defenses around it. And that's why in such marriages, uh, there can be very little feeling that passes between two people. I mean, it can be really, even if it's not openly hostile, it's almost like th these are not marriages that are openly hostile. These are marriages where there's just a sort of icy flow of air between two people where there's not a lot of warmth. There's not a lot of heat either, but there's not, you know, there's, there's not eye mm -hmm. contact. There's not tenderness. And, and that's that process of kind of letting thorns grow around your heart. Mm. And and the um, ambivalent situation that that creates that the first of all the thorns are organic in one sense that mm -hmm. untended areas of the forest will grow great mm -hmm. briar patches because the deer are not nibbling it down or it's undisturbed or it's an ideal condition in some ways but that yes it may seem necessary to protect us from painful interactions with spouses or other people that are antagonizing us, but it also leaves us um, asleep and unchallenged and, and uncontacted, even if the contact is antagonistic, frustrating. So that rejection of contact for all the reasons that we do, all the frustrations that we may have, has this secondary effect, uh, the secondary effect of putting something to sleep inside of us. Now, the sleepiness may allow us to tolerate a marriage that we're very unhappy mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. So we're, our sexuality is just going to go to sleep because it's not active, or our creativity is going to go to sleep because the partnership doesn't welcome it, any number of things. But that, that barrier to um, vigorous engagement, wherever that may lead, mm -hmm. um, creates problems on both sides of the briar wall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm thinking about the um, hedge of thorns and the, and the sleep 
mm-hmm. uh, as an image of dissociation. Mm-hmm. That um, just don't notice it. It's just not there. It, it's such an image of real splitting off of that rather than having to feel the feelings and uh, using the example you've given of, of, you know, that marriages can go through dry spells, Mm -hmm. difficulties, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of soldiering on, and that it's painful to feel the feelings of lack of connection and lack of affection, tenderness, energy. So we just don't feel the feelings. Mm -hmm. We, We just, some part of us goes to sleep. Um, and so we don't have to consciously experience it uh, to the full extent that we might of how disappointing this is that mm-hmm. after X number of years of marriage and maybe a couple of kids and dual careers that uh, it's just too hard to feel how hard this is. And so up goes the hedge of thorns, up goes a kind of of psychic sleep mm-hmm. that I, I just split that off. And, and it seems like there's no feeling there. The other thing I'd like to bring up is the possibility of a kind of multi-generational trauma hmm. that we don't understand why the, the queen is infertile. Um, but she suffers from, from this difficulty this difficulty of receiving um, the masculine psychologically, spiritually, a relationship to the animus, some relationship to her own spirit. And then that same problem is transferred to the daughter, that she too is kept in a state of sterility. Yeah. And it passes down that she too cannot be find the fertile spirit. And and the briar or the spindle could very well be this repeating pattern that the mother, and perhaps even beyond that, carries some kind of a barrier, some kind of a trouble that then is reproduced in the teenage Mm -hmm. daughter and is finally overcome, even as it is in the mother, through an intervention of some kind. And I think that that is something that can also happen that the mother has a difficulty and that pattern is then passed to the daughter, even though it is perhaps not her own lived experience. And I've seen this both in uh, sons and daughters, that the um, trauma of the parents comes to the child in these very frightened admonitions. You know, you must be very careful about this or this kind of person is terribly dangerous. You mustn't ever be alone with this kind of person in these uh, prohibitions, these frightening prohibitions, mm-hmm. tumble down through generations, uh, often being housed in children, though they themselves haven't experienced uh, these wounds or these uh, dangers. They can become so vigilant, so thorn bound by the fears mm. of several generations back that uh, they are then isolated. And I know I have very much seen that in analysis. Well, in a way, that's kind of like burning the spindles, right? You know, it's like, the, you know, the, the parents are always trying to protect the kids from um, the known difficulties. And in a way that inevitably uh, sets up an experience <clears throat> where the, 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 the child is, is going to encounter that mm-hmm. very thing, just like exactly. in this fairy tale. Right. Right. So the frog comes up Mm -hmm. out of the well, gives a solution. The prince somehow finds his way through the briars. But interestingly, the briars in the story autonomously part. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which is very interesting. So we we have this um, intervention of the transpersonal. Mm-hmm. That something uncanny 
and magical and strange occurs um, when the timing is right, mm -hmm. which then gives us a sense of, or a question of what are the hundred years? Yeah. And what's being worked out in, at the end of the hundredth year, such that the entire field, the entire gestalt, that the psychic atmosphere is now so ready, it just requires the presence of the new thing, and suddenly the defenses uh, melt right. away. So, so um, what I'll uh, what I'm going to say to that because I think it's really a, a lovely message that the fairy tale is sending us. You know, I I, I made up this little case about a, a woman being unhappy in a marriage, but of course it's kind of composite, and I've heard many similar stories. And and I even just this past couple of weeks, I've heard some version of this story. And what I'll say is that when we wake up, there's often a feeling of guilt. Like, look how long I stayed in it without saying something. You know, I stayed in the marriage too long. I should have said something earlier. If I'd been more assertive earlier, maybe everything would have been different. But in some sense, the fairy tale is saying, it takes the time it takes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It takes the time it takes to know that the marriage is not going to work. It takes the time it takes for you to be sure that it's really time to leave. It, it just takes the time it takes, and it invites us to be accepting mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. Uh, it takes a complete cycle somehow, and that uh, it's beyond ego. Something deep within is working on it. And I agree with you. I don't think there are very many people who look back at something that they were kind of stuck in or didn't know and go, oh, my gosh, you know, I wish I had known then what I know now. I wish I'd known then that I um, could have done this sooner or I wish I had done that or I didn't realize that. And uh, it takes the time that it takes. You know, we look back and say, oh, I, I could have woken up to this so much sooner, you know, and then I could have gotten on with that, that next stage of life. I didn't have to wait until my mid-40s. I could have done that when I was 30, mm -hmm. but, but you couldn't ha have. And I think in a way, this is such a hard tale uh, be because it goes against our belief that uh, we could think our way through things. We can solve problems. We can take action. We can make plans. We can do things. Uh, whereas it takes a long time for us to come to conscious realization of, of a great many things in life. And when the time is right, uh, we realize it. And maybe that's a great place to yeah. stop and switch to a dream. Before we uh, go to our dream, um, let me say, as we do every week, a few words about dream school. We do this on the podcast. People really are interested in it. It's the life of the psyche. And you can learn more about that if you want to by going to thisunionlife.com. Take a look at Dream School. Okay, here's our dream for this week. Our dreamer is a woman. She's 59. She's a cook. And the title that she's given this dream is Loving Betrayal. And here's the dream. I am in a house in France. I am having an affair with one of my father's old friends, someone I loved deeply. He was funny and charismatic. His wife was nearby chatting to someone. He was being kind and attentive to her. I took Steve into the house and hugged him. I explained that I was grateful he was being kind to his wife. I wanted him to know. 
We got into a car. He may have turned into my husband. I'm not sure. He was driving really erratically, but in full control. We drove up to the village wildly and exhilaratingly, past the cemetery where my mother and father are buried. For content, she says, My husband of 30 years has had an affair and is now with the woman he has secretly been seeing for six years. My mother and father were never keen on him. He has left me because we lived too close to my family, and he could not build his castle with me. We had a deep love, and his betrayal has devastated me. I'm anxious that he has hidden sides to him that I have stupidly been blind to. The main feelings in the dream, she says, were kindness, love, and acceptance. And for additional context, she says, My father's old friend reminds me of my husband. One thing I forgot to say. In the morning, the first thing that appeared on Facebook minutes after waking was a post from my father's friend who died 25 years ago from his son. I have not seen a post from him in years. So this dream has a really poignant context, Mm -hmm. which is this woman has been devastated by this deep, deep betrayal. And and it is, yeah, and it's very, um, Mm -hmm. you know, we look to our dreams often, at least I do, in times of of distress, and they often produce very cryptic messages for us. Sometimes they produce these kind of pearls of... uh, um, Uh, of comfort, but sometimes they produce images like this, where we think, well, I know there's a message here, and I just, what what could it be? But the the psyche has something to say about this betrayal. And let's see if we can discern maybe partly what it is. Well, one of the things that can be very painful to hold, particularly in the beginning of a devastating process, is how our conscious experience immediately constellates its opposite in some nodal point in the unconscious. So even as we are devastated at learning that we have been betrayed, and and that's a fact, and that requires this painful change of feeling and understanding and life circumstance. But somewhere in the unconscious, there is a nodal image of being the betrayer, even as we are betrayed. Mm-hmm. Which Jung talks about these pairs of opposites, that all sides of our lived experience vibrate, and they must. Every time we're victimized, there is a tiny image of a perpetrator in the unconscious every time we perpetrate. There is a tiny image of a victim in our own unconscious, as all possibilities do. We're greedy, and there's a bit of benevolence inside of us. We're charitable, and there's a point of greed somewhere that's ignited Mm -hmm. in the unconscious. And so, in this dream, the dreamer has an opportunity to experience herself as the dream ego, you know, being the one who is participating in the betrayal. Mm. And to even conceive that such a betrayal is still carried out in a state of love, that she deeply loves this man who she's having an affair with, or she's Mm -hmm. facilitating this betrayal of his wife. Something that's very very difficult to understand when we are being left, that perhaps our spouse is actually in some deep state of love of the other person Mm -hmm. that compels them to act in a way that is unimaginable to those of us who are being left behind. You you know, um, you've sparked uh, some some of my thoughts, Mm -hmm. Joseph, and I'm also thinking how well this dream kind of maps on to you know, the fairy tale that we were talking about, that, that, you know, there was a period of six years where this woman's husband was having an affair and there was 
a kind of somnolence, a, a kind of innocence and not knowing. And then her feelings in waking life, understandably, of, of feeling just devastated. But here's the dream where there's life. Uh, the dream goes in France. She's having a, an affair, someone she really loves deeply. And uh, then maybe he turns into her husband. She's not sure. They're driving wildly, erratically. Uh, he's driving, but in full control. That part of her psyche. Um, and then they go past the cemetery where the parental complexes, mother and father, are buried. But in this dream, there's life. The dream mm -hmm. ego is, is in love and exhilarated uh, in contrast to her waking state of, of betrayal mm -hmm. and, yeah. and devastation. Yeah, that's a, that's, a good, that's a good point. They're both good points. I mean, so one of the questions that I have about this dream is there's something about the parents that feels really mm -hmm. important. So, it, so that the animus, the inner masculine potential shows up as this image of a fa her father's good friend. Mm -hmm. And then the end of the dream takes us past the cemetery where her parents are buried. And then in her associations, she says, um, <clears throat> and I thought this was really important um she says her parents never really liked her husband yes and and that he left because uh they lived too close to her family so i don't know quite what to do about this but there's some i mean i guess i could be of two minds about it and and i, I i'm really just sort of thinking out loud here but but first of all it struck me that her parents were never crazy about him because that could be either uh, that her parents, you know, kind of had an intuition or an intimation that he might not, he might not, um, he might not be such a great guy. Or it could be that uh, there was a way that she wasn't able to psychologically separate from her parents. And 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 her parents may not have wanted her to psychologically separate, so they kind of whispered a little poison in her ear about the husband. Mm -hmm. I'm just making this up, absolutely making it up. Uh, and 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 then it's interesting to me that the husband kind of said, "We're we're too attached to your family." So somehow uh, I'm just I don't I don't quite know which way to go with it, but I'm I'm aware that there's some. There's something important here about is the libido attached to the father or to the husband? And has mm -hmm. there been a kind of battle, the whole marriage, about that? And, and uh, it would seem in a way that she's uh, kind of giving allegiance maybe more to the, the parental complexes and, and yeah. their memory in choosing to have this affair with her father's friend, but I don't know. Yeah. And that I think lifts up, especially the father complex, uh, that in the dream, um, the affair is with one of the father's old friends. So it's somebody who's older and who is somehow associated with the father. And, uh, and then, you know, the wild affair and driving and so on. But, um, he could not build his castle with me, is what she says. So I'm building on your idea, Lisa, of maybe there was an attachment there that was, you know, especially to the father that, pre that prevented the husband from forging an inner home, a separate dwelling, metaphorically speaking, with her that... I don't think it's the geographic proximity that was the problem. Mm -hmm. It was more, it was the psychological uh, attachment or inability to separate that was the problem. And we don't know, obviously, we are just speculating, but yes, but yeah, we that's, are. That's exactly right.
so I'm thinking, Lisa, about your um, idea that the dream ego could have been holding some ambivalence that her parents felt about her being married at all, or perhaps mm. her being married to this fellow, and what potentially poisonous effect that may have had on the relationship. And then I'm looking at the dream and asking, well, well where is the medicine for that in the dream symbolism? So one bit of medicine could be that she drives past the cemetery where her mother and father are buried. And so mm -hmm. it is in its subtle way, is the dream maker um, trying to communicate that whatever power that the parents had, whatever attitudes that she may have consciously or unconsciously inherited from her parents, that they are long gone, that, that they've lost their potency, and that old things must pass away. Mm. Old attitudes, old beliefs, the influences of of past generations. And it's a subtle kind of mm -hmm. signal, but it makes sense. It, it, I, I, I like it, and I think interestingly, you know, sort of spatially in the dream, the village, the place where they're going, is beyond the cemetery. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's it's a it's a little cryptic this dream. But um, it is, it's subtle. Mm -hmm. And the feelings in the dream are kindness, love, and acceptance. Mm -hmm. So if we even step away from the sequencing of the images, but we say, as she is grieving and still working through the loss and the betrayal, that part of the medicine of the self is to give her this dose of kindness, mm. a dose of love. Mm -hmm. and a dose of acceptance, and isn't that so much of what we would pray for mm -hmm. when we are moving through a devastating loss or a devastating change, that, that there is still kindness in the world, that she is still loved and capable of loving, and that she has the power to accept this kind of radical change of structure mm -hmm. in herself and in her environment. Which is sort of further imaged, Joseph, uh, with this thing that happens where she's really happy that Steve is being kind to his wife. She's grateful mm -hmm. that there's kindness. And so there's a sense that, um, yeah, that this, this could, there, there could be a kind of coming together of the opposites somehow, mm -hmm. as painful yeah. as this territory is. Yeah. And I, I love what you uh, mentioned earlier, that they're actually going to the village mm -hmm. uh, where there's life, where there's community, relationship, etc. Uh, they're going past the cemetery. Mm -hmm. So th th that is in the past as they go past, mm -hmm. and that the telos, the forward direction of the dream, is to new life in the village. To the village, yeah. Mm-hmm. I would in also introduce one extremely psychologically compli complicated piece that uh, over the years that I have worked with uh, analysands, as have we all, and I've worked, of course, with individuals, male and female, who have either instigated or have been in an affair while they've mm -hmm. been married. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the dream puts forward this very complicated dynamic that a spouse can love their spouse even as they love the person they're having an affair mm. with. That, that is very complicated to understand. I'm not suggesting that that sanctions the, the betrayal, but it mm. speaks to how complicated the human yeah. heart is. <laughs> and so even as the dream ego is mm. having an affair, She's with a man whom she loves and who loves her, and he seems to love his wife and treats her kindly in the mm -hmm. context. That speaks to the very complicated realities of love and um, cultural expect expectations and what the norms are within cultures. Um, 
and the difficulty that we sometimes find ourselves in of of funneling our love into a single primary relationship and how complicated that is although we do expect that of our spouses of course and that she's being introduced to that larger complicated dynamic mm -hmm. and 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 maybe maybe just to to turn toward a slightly more kind of strictly psychological view of the dream which i think picks up on something you said earlier deb which i really liked like if this if these are all inner figures if if uh, if steve is an inner figure a figure of her uh unrealized potential perhaps that's part of what the animus is she is um exhilaratingly aligned with it Mm -hmm. And she can also accept the shadow part of herself, and that would be uh, Steve's wife. Mm -hmm. And and she's she, like you that. know there's some some are all parts of the psyche are in harmony, and and so that explains the positive feelings in the dream and the sense that there is more life. You've been listening to this Jungian life. From our website, thisunionlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this union life.